Dear distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning for participants in Europe and good afternoon for guests in China. My name is Kevin Tu. I am the managing director of Agora Energy Translation China. It's a great honor to moderate today's webinar in discussion of Europe-China energy and climate relations. This event is co-organized by Agora Energy Translation, Shanghai Institute for International Studies, and GI-led China. Against the backdrop of COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war, energy security becomes a major concern in Europe, China, and beyond. Coincidentally, the EU-China summit is convened today. Given the rising geopolitical tension, how can Europe and China mutually benefit from exchanges and collaboration on decarbonization? What would be the biggest challenge in China's decarbonization process? And how could China address them based on European experience? Would the Chinese practice also benefit energy transition agenda in Europe? To answer these questions, we have invited a very impressive list of Chinese and European experts to join today's dialogue. Without further ado, I would like to invite my colleague, Ms. Jessie Scott, Direct International Program at Agora Energy Transition to deliver uh, eight minutes opening remarks. Jesse, the floor is yours. Kevin, thank you very much. May I check that the sound is working? Okay, I assume that that is going well. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, for the introduction. Thank you, Mariana. And I have the honor because we have many interesting and valuable speakers today. So I'm going to say a little bit about Agora Energy Vendor's own work to contribute in our modest way towards the Europe-China, China-Europe, it's a two-way process, dialogue about the energy transition, in particular on three key topics. But let me start first with the um, current global context, which is uh, many crises. We are seeing an era of what we like to refer to as megatrends, and these are in several directions that impact the energy system and that clearly all have implications for success in reducing emissions and succeeding in uh, managing the climate crisis that we face. Um, I think we face a paradox at the moment. Those of us who work on the energy transition the word transition because we are better in the understanding that a well planned um, over time smooth process is the better way to experience a transition in such a major sector of the economy. It is much preferable to transition over time and smoothly beginning soon in order to arrive at some of the outcomes that the climate targets require. To transition by uh, continuing on business as usual and then to make a crash change is going to be extremely painful, extremely expensive. However, the paradox is that there is no question, as we say in Europe, and I'm sure there is a Chinese version of this, there is a virtue to crisis. The crisis that's right here also will change. And as I said, they have implications for energy and climate that enable some difficult decisions about doing things differently in the future to be considered today rather than only as a debate for tomorrow. So in the context of that paradox of smooth transition and the virtue of crisis, let me look at why we need to do this at a European Chinese, and indeed US and global level. Here, of course, we show also Russia, a major actor, um, and a major actor very much 
um, in that crisis mode at the moment. Clearly, nobody can solve this problem on their own. All are economically interlinked and all are interlinked in terms of the emissions outcomes. And in terms of the emissions outcomes, we are all dependent upon one another for success and survival. That means that Agora has focused in our work, our modest contribution on three key themes. I want to mention first uh, the role of green hydrogen. That is um, fuels produced from green electricity, electrofuels as we sometimes call them in Europe. Hydrogen has been a hot topic uh, for a number of years, really in the context that it is not possible to deliver climate neutrality, net zero emissions, without some green energy dense molecular energy, as well as many, many, many green electrons. And the additional crisis with the Russian invasion of the Ukraine has certainly increased the reasons to look to green sources of fuels. So in 2021, Agora launched by thinking about the steel sector, which we know will need green fuels for its high temperature heat processes. And you can see online our global steel transformation tracker. There's a lot of news in the steel sector at the moment, and we have decided it is a useful support to everybody to bring together the information, the updates, the data around this sector. We also organized workshops beginning to discuss what the green hydrogen economy can look like in China and in Europe. And we will be producing a number of papers. We just signed an MOU with China EV100, I'm very pleased to announce. And these will be the further services in 2022. But let's not forget, hydrogen is by no means the only answer, even if it's the trendy one at the moment. At least as important is to continue to think about how we bring renewables and distributed renewables into the electricity system so that we can benefit from wind and solar, geothermal, and the other smaller modular sources that are part of the green electricity solution. And so that we can do that in a way which produces energy security and reliability in electric grids. Here is a snapshot of distributed renewables in China to date. And as you can see, the growth patterns have been um, fluctuating, but there is a steady trend upwards for the share of distributed PV. This is now an important factor. And that means a lot of implications for grid management. This is an area where Agora has some experience from the German and the European context, which we are eager to exchange with the Chinese stakeholders and to listen to your experiences in return. Then, of course, we have the fundamental source of the emissions in the electricity sector and other economic sectors today, coal. Now, the coal transition is very much in that category of a smooth transition, a well-planned early transition will be better to manage than a crash transition. Um, and in this context, of course, there is a particular focus on very coal intensive regions where the economy has been built around coal. So here we feel again, there is a strong opportunity for German and European exchanges with China on the planning of the transition out of coal, both for the energy system and for the regional economy and for the social implications in the regional economy. This is how to diversify regional economies away from coal, how to diversify the workforce in a way that does not produce um, unemployment and the social disruption that, that would imply. And Agora has been working on this since the beginning of our efforts in China, which go back to 2016, but scaled up uh, massively in 2019, 2020, just at the moment that COVID arrived with its other challenges. And we have done many, many workshops on this. I want to mention where we will go in 2022, which is that we have just completed a preliminary mapping of understanding the corporates, particularly the big state-owned enterprises in China in the context of coal transition. As is well known, um, 
a detailed understanding of the assets, the cash flow, the financing of these companies and of their coal assets is a little difficult. So it has been very interesting to build a data set um, and a data set that we will be making public and available to um, those we, we are working with, uh, to our many, many partners among many types of stakeholders. And this has involved some interesting learning. Why are we doing this? Because it will be essential that the major corporate actors, and here you can see the global scale, so I underline the word major, have a helpful process around transition. Transition will not be easy. And transition strategies are something that many companies around the world are discussing, but that also will be individual to different companies, depending upon those elements for their business model that we are trying to express in the data set. So thank you very much for listening to a little bit about Agora's work in China, led by my esteemed colleague, Kevin, and supported by a team both in Beijing and here in Berlin. Let me wrap up with a conclusion. I mentioned the virtue of crisis at the beginning. I'm actually a historian by training. And why do you study history? You study history because you're interested in the future. And the fact that the future is very different from the past, but it must build upon the past. One of the things history indicates is that crisis often leads to transformation. Crises are challenging, but they also enable new thinking in a way that business as usual in non-crisis circumstances, to some extent, does not enable. However, crises bring short-term implications and a desire for short-term solutions. And short-term solutions are not necessarily the right solutions to deliver longer-term goals. This is the challenge we face in the debate between energy security where there is an inclination to very short-term solutions, and the energy transition to the climate targets, where the objectives are long-term and structural. We strive as Agora, as an international think tank with a German heart, to collaborate with like-minded partners, different stakeholders around the world. And of course, China is one of the most important parts of that international program. So, against the backdrop of the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Germany and China, an important moment, we see it as a very clear message that the two countries should continue to strengthen their bilateral collaborations and dialogues, and I look forward to the rest of today's event as a small contribution toward that. Kevin, thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you very much, Jesse for your comprehensive introduction of Agora's efforts to transfer German and European experience on energy transition to China. So, thank you very much, Jesse, for your introduction. And now, we would like to invite Director of Institute for Comparative Politics and Public Policy from Shanghai Institute for International Studies, Dr. Yu Hongyuan. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to co-host this event together with Agora. On behalf of our institute, I would like to thank you all very much for participating in this event. My topic today is the joint leadership of China and Europe, and I'm going to talk about the competition together with the cooperation and how we can navigate in between to finally arrive at a co-leadership and at the same time prevent a zero-sum game from forming. Just now, as we have heard from the previous presentation between China and Europe, there is key cooperation, but there is also competition in the field of key technologies and key resources. Uh, we also have cooperation in green finance and the SDG related issues. Uh, but we also are competing with each other in, for example, carbon tariffs and other carbon rules. 
And in terms of the future structure of the global governance, we are also engaged in both cooperation and competition. And also between the companies in both lands, there have been hundreds of years of cooperation and at the same time competition. This is an unprecedented era, and we can see that such competition uh, has been affecting our bilateral relationship, but there is also cooperation that must be acknowledged, serving as a great foundation for our relationship. Uh, neither party could live without the other side, because in the future, both sides will have to rely on each other for the institutions, for the technologies, as well as the market. But at the same time, we are also seeing that there is going to be a fundamental change in the energy market in the world after the U Ukrainian crisis. And the leadership structure or dynamics will also change among China, the US, and Europe. Uh, so everybody around the world, it is fair to say, that is paying attention to energy transition. Um, you're not sharing your screen, doctor. I hope you can see my screen now. Thank you for the reminder. And. Uh, so based on everything we've mentioned above, we can see to different extent that, there, that changes are happening in the system, in the institution, in almost all possible aspects and on all possible levels. So when it comes to the bilateral relationship that features both competition and cooperation, we actually should be seeking co-leadership. Uh, I just cannot agree more with what has been mentioned already that China and Europe should each play to the fullest of their competitive edge in improving the productivity. We have different advantages and it can be a positive some game between us. We should be reaching agreements, consensus, and promoting the positive development of the green economy around the world. And this will in turn help us prevent the geopolitical uh, negative effects on both, on both sides development. Well, today we are seeing that in, between us and there are quite a lot of risks, for example, the decoupling policies promoted by certain countries or other geopolitical or north-south uh, contradictions are hindering our bilateral relationship.欧洲强调的全球门户战略自主中国强调了绿色一带的一路和全球发展倡议之间是一直是在存在的对接的关系那么在另外一个基础上我们其实在四个方面在全球治理贸易投资议题伙伴以及未来的全球新的碳治理方
I have shown about this framework. So for example, on these challenges and also on the China and also the comparative uh, advantage of both parties, I think we can have a positive collaboration, no matter it's about the cooperation based uh, competition between the think tanks and also between the business. I think definitely that will help to solve these potential issues between China and Europe. At the same time, this kind of the cooperation is not only about one topic, actually it's more about the governance in the future. And also it will be an integration of the system, including the crops, the resource, mining, data, and also the power systems. It will be a overall governance framework, which definitely lead the leadership. So in this way that we can, when facing this kind of the transition, we can have this the green development and also the transitions. And also we can connect this kind of the gateway and to have the cooperation on both parties. So you can see that in the future, I think our target is that for China, EU, and also our understanding the proposal of the eco-civilization of China and also the zero emission proposed by Europe. I shall say that we have a lot of commonalities with each other. So for example, like the 50 years ago, when Premier Zhou Enlai sent the delegation for the Environment Congress in Europe, I shall say that from that time, China and Europe has started to work on the environment governance. So this year, we shall say that on the energy and the many sectors, it has been almost a half a century. Our cooperation had been going on for over half a century already and targeting on the future, there could be even more comprehensive cooperation. That is the end of what I want to share with you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yu. As a, an experienced research fellow at a top level think tank within China, he had shared with us a very in-depth thinking towards the future cooperation between China and Europe. Thank you very much again. And next, we will move on to the panel discussion session of today's event. Uh, our topic this for this event will be the uh, prospect of cooperation in terms of ener energy and climate between China and Europe. We are very honored to have invited the top experts in this field. Uh, please turn on your camera. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Chao Jinchen, Director General of the National Climate Center at China Meteorological Administration, and Director Mr. Mark Antoine and Matsega from the Center of Energy and Climate at FRI, and Dr. Xiao Yu, Chief Economist at Orient Securities, and Ms. Bernice Lee, Research Director from the Futures uh, Chatham House. And I would like to invite Dr. Chao Qingchen first to give us a three minute comment for the previous two presentations. And also I raised a question at the very beginning and it would be the best if you can answer, provide us with your answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Tu. I want to thank the organizer for the invitation. I think this is a very meaningful topic that we are centering on today. And I have heard great insights from the previous two presentations. Uh, I would like to briefly just comment on the two presentations. First, uh, Jesse, uh, I, I agreed with Jesse a lot as she mentioned that we need a forward looking planning and a stable uh, transition. Um, in the process of decarbonization, the biggest challenge for China, I think we should see, is, is that China is currently experiencing a special phase in its development. So the challenge faced by China in decarbonization is way bigger than that faced by Europe. The total emission for China is about three times that of uh, Europe. So a rapid 
decarbonization will be extremely difficult. And when it comes to economic development, economic development in, in Europe has already decoupled with the carbon emission. But China is still um, experiencing rising economic development. So there must be a coordinated development with, carb with decarbonization. And there is inherently a conflict in between. So this is also representing challenge. And then if we look at the energy endowment in China, the coal consumption in all our energy consumption, although has been brought down sure. to a great extent, it still takes up 56%. So a rapid switch towards an a uh, renewable energy center energy portfolio or structure requires us to balance uh, the fossil fuels and other fuels too. Um, and also we need to uh, realize that in terms of technologies, there is still a long way to go for China. So the challenge for China is even bigger than that elsewhere. And then Dr. Yu mentioned this win-win uh, cooperation or a better strengthening the cooperation while reducing competition is also a great point. Uh, in fact, China and Europe have respective competitive edges in many ways. So in the future, we have a very bright prospect of cooperation. For example, um, the policy system, policy design, and uh, awareness of green development in all these aspects, the EU has been leading in the world. So there is a lot that we can learn from the EU in terms of the strategy, legislation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these will be greatly valuable for China when we uh, march towards the uh, zero carbon uh, goal. Uh, and technologies, as have been mentioned, are quite uh, important. For example, hydrogen energy, energy storage, etc. And then the carbon market building, carbon tariffs, the carbon pricing, etc. In all these aspects, we need to better communicate and share experience. And then industrial solutions, for example, in some of the European cities and countries, uh, might be great reference for some places in China. There could be, for example, pilots and other similar projects in China. And then global governance is also an important point. Uh, Europe is an important facilitator of the Paris Agreement. So in the implementation of the Paris Agreement, China and Europe uh, could really join hands together to achieve the final goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chao. You have mentioned very important points, for example, how to balance a uh, different target of policies and how to balance short-term and mid-term and long-term. And you also talked about uh, some of your suggestions for the cooperation between China and Europe. Huh. Director at uh, the Center for Energy and Climate of IFRI to deliver three minutes intervention, Mark Antoine. You would either comment on the two opening remarks or answer the question I raised in the beginning. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to uh, be part of this very important discussion. And uh, we are uh, China and the European Union in the same boat we will face devastating consequences of climate change degradation and environmental degradation. So in spite of our growing political differences, we have a shared interest in addressing and continuing to work hard on finding common solutions to basically survive. And um, let me come up with a couple of proposals that will complement what we have already heard. The first is uh, related to hydrogen. We now have rising gas prices, which make everywhere in the world 
or almost everywhere in the world, gray hydrogen production from natural gas, much more expensive, and green hydrogen production, much more competitive versus gray hydrogen production. So why don't we work for the next G20 presided by Indonesia on an initiative to progressively replace part of the gray hydrogen used in refineries, be it produced from coal or from gas, with green hydrogen. Second point related to maritime uh, transportation. We have a common interest here to work together to progressively reduce emissions in the maritime transport sector because we so much depend and will continue to depend on international maritime trade. And, um, and here I really see also a major avenue of cooperation to line up the development of new fuels in the respective port infrastructure, but also in the respective, of course, ship constructions. And that is about basically ammonia, green LNG, LNG, and then green LNG, or methane. And here, really, I think more discussions need to happen. A third point on nuclear, I think we have to make sure nuclear technologies and industries are not subject to international sanctions. So I think we really need to make sure that China develops in China every year at least five or six new nuclear reactors, that US sanctions do not prevent this from happening, and that China in turn really concentrates on ramping up nuclear in China as opposed to in other countries abroad. The fourth point relates to fugitive methane emissions. China has not signed up to the global methane pledge, and we know that this is a major threat methane emissions, fugitive methane emissions. And so I would really like to see some progress there. Of course, it's also related to fugitive methane emissions from coal mines, but this is a, a real serious issue that needs to be tackled, and it can be done pretty easily. Another point relates to imported deforestation. We in Europe are now very aggressively working to reduce the imported deforestation and to bring it to zero. China has done extreme progress and you know, really commendable action to cut and stop deforestation in China. But the problem is China's imported deforestation is growing with huge global environmental consequences. And so I think China could really take this much more seriously and, and start tackling that. Another point to complement on, on steel, I think it's absolutely critical that indeed we, in Europe, with the United States, with China, with Turkey, start within the G20 to implement a roadmap to progressively decarbonize steel production globally. And with the growing coal and gas prices that we now have, this is the time to do it. And, and so I, I really can only but encourage the work that you are planning to do on that. Um, on plastics, clearly also uh, another major avenue to reduce and also to improve plastic recycling. Um, a brief word on, uh, on coal-fired power generation. I think it's also now time for the... EU and China to work together, not only to stop new investment in coal abroad, but to stop to start financing the, the advanced closure of some of the coal-fired power plants in operation in the world and replace them with low-carbon energy system. This is a win-win for everyone, and it can really have a huge impact because there are still so many very emitting, very old coal-fired power plants that are operating globally. If we close them in the coming years, I think we can make a big difference uh, for the climate. 
A last point, if you allow, uh, which is, I think, uh, also quite important, relates to carbon capture and storage. What we will really need to see is uh, the EU and China saying, well, we will work towards 2030 to at least, for example, uh, develop projects that can allow us in 10 years in each of our regions to store and sequestrate about 10 to 15 million tons of CO2. And then by 2035, to bring this up to 100 or 150 million tons in each of our regions to really make this happen. And now is also the right time to do it. And I think China has nice technologies and things to, to develop there, and so do we. Um, voilà, a couple of points from uh, my side and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Mark Anton, thank you so much for this comprehensive list, including hydrogen, maritime transportation, nuclear, fugitive methane emissions, imported deforestation, decarbonization of steel, plastics recycling, coal power, and the CCUS. What a list. Uh, I may actually also add one more agenda item here. How about the critical minerals? They are so important for green energy transition with its <coughs> fundamental political implications. I personally feel Europe and China should collaborate and work together on this very important issue instead of compete and confront it with each other on this vitally important issue. 现在我想邀请啊，东方证券首席经济学家邵宇红。So now I would like to give floor to Shao Yu. Welcome, Dr. Shao from Orient Securities. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Shao Yu. I'm the chief economist of Orient Securities. So thank you very much for the discussion because I do the microeconomic analysis. So I think there are several points I would like to make too. First of all, China has made the commitment to have the carbon peaking by 2030. So according to our research, the carbon peaking is quite related to the urbanization and the industrialization. So that means in the next 10 to 15 years, it will be a very, the last stage of the rapid growth of China. So all, uh, Europe has already surpassed this stage. So that means the urbanization should be more than 80%. Manufacturing accounts for more than 35%. So for any country that you finish all your industrializations, infrastructure, housing, apartment, public service, utilities, or even that the products to be exported to the other countries, for example, made in Japan, made in Germany, and everything will be quite stable. So this is a prerequisite that we can talk about. But currently in China, I think we still have a very crucial window in the next decade. But recently, after the pandemic and Russia-Ukraine conflict. So people think that now what we need is about not about that how to achieve the last stage, but we want to prevent the high inflation of China to maintain our economic growth. I think it is possible that around the world there will be a stagnation. And another one is about the green, infl green inflation in the stagnation. So green inflation means, of course, we have the targets of the carbon peaking and carbon neutrality. But currently, the Russian-Ukraine conflict, because these are the two resource countries, so they have accelerated this tight supply in the global market. So in the past, maybe through the carbon trading to reduce emission and to rebalance of the global economy, it can be a smooth process. But now, because of the conflict, it will not be as smooth as we thought we the traditional resource is very expensive and now the conflict has also led to the interruption of the supply chain so you can see that considering about the high emission and against the pandemic the economy will be more serious and a challenge. And so that's why the traditional resource is very expensive. So that's why that the PPI is very high. And also for the large commodities, like Kevin mentioned, nickel or lithium, 
which are the main metal used for the energy storage, the price is also rocketing now. So these kind of the critical minerals for the energy storage may also challenge the new business models of the new energy. So that means for the new energy now, the business model may not be as competitive as the traditional resource, and the price will also be increasing, and that will be leading to the superinflation. So even the Fed, the Federal Reserve takes some policy reactions. But now you can see, considering the demographic structure, the global supply chain, we can never have our inflation go back to 2% in the past three decades. In the past three decades, we can call it that the great moderation. But in the next 10 to 15 years, we need to get prepared. The inflation will be much higher, and it will never go back to where we used to have for the inflation. But China also needs the next 10 to 15 years to finish the last stage of our urbanization and industrialization. So that's why, against all this background, we need to find the, some command commonalities between China and Europe. I agree with the previous speakers because we are from the industries uh, and I'm from the investment banks. So that's why when we look at the specific project, for example, carbon trading, green hydrogen, a lot of investment have pulled into this kind of the projects. And for, for example, our company, we have invested into the huge green hydrogen, and also we use the offshore wind power that to add the hydrogen. And in Shanghai, currently, there are a lot of the hydrogen station for the refill of the new energy vehicles. In infrastructure, you can see that a lot of energy has already been introduced. But now what we need more is the technical breakthroughs. And this is something that we can work with Europe. So China is studying from Europe, but we can also use some joint venture between China and Europe to have some technology breakthroughs. And also it will be just like the new energy vehicles. So you can see that after the China-US, the trade war, Tesla has got the permission to build their factory of the Tesla in Shanghai. So that's why we can leverage this kind of potential between China and Europe. And for the green hydrogen, there are many opportunities. Another opportunity is that in China, we have a huge the internet platform. So, for example, we have invested in a company to do the carbon trading, carbon service for the CCUS. For example, this platform can calculate how much carbon you emit in your life and how much carbon the company has emitted. And the company can buy of the green carbon credit. And there are many businesses that with this kind of demand. So in the future, more people would like to reduce their energy and the companies can also honor their social commitment. So for example, we can also buy some ESG report or some of the ESG um, credit from this platform. So you can see on the technology, on the business models, actually there are a lot of innovation and we are looking forward to work our European partners I think that if we can work on the specific projects, I know that for our Euro European partners, you are the think tank. So think tanks can give the policy recommendations, but we can also work on the specific projects. We can also have the discussion and collaboration case by case, no matter it's the joint venture or some of the technical collaboration between China and Europe. And in this way, I think we can contribute to the carbon peaking and the carbon neutrality of China. China can definitely be a big test band for many of the technologies. Thank you very much, Dr. Shao, for sharing with us on his perspective from the investment bank. And he also compared the different models of working or different approaches at the investment banks and at, uh, at the think tanks. This is very inspiring. And the floor is yours. Uh, you, you need to unmute yourself. Hello, Bernice. Uh, we could, yes, now you have been unmuted. Yes, 
Sorry about that. Uh, the, the machine was uh, doing something funny. Hi. Thank you very much, everybody. And it's a great honor for me to be here. And uh, I was asked to sort of think a little bit about the UK-China dynamics and the context of uh, obviously what we are seeing today. And, and what, what I think is interesting as a departure point is sort of thinking through some of the questions around where we are in the creation of the global low carbon economy. So when we think about where we are today, we are all in the position of being co-creators of the low carbon economy when we have the dynamics that everyone has been talking about, which is a combination of competitiveness and collabor collaboration being the important dynamics, the choice between the two, the flip-flop being a, the sort of dynamic that is driving the thinking at the moment. But as a co-creator of the low-carbon economy, whether or not you choose to compete or you choose to collaborate, what is quite clear is that there are enormous transaction costs involved if indeed we develop standards and other institutions. I think Dr. Yu provided a wonderful list. I love the three that he mentioned in terms of you know, institutions, markets, and technologies. We know that there will be huge transaction costs associated with parallel play if we develop separate ones. And while we are building a low carbon economy, I mean, the, the analogy is not a great one, but since Agora Givenda is a German, I can say that you're we're basically building a car while we're driving at the same time. And that actually means that as we learn how to do things, as we learn how to do things and set up different standards to drive the fast moving nature that we know we needed for the global delivery of the low carbon economy, it is more important than ever that we act together, whether together in collaborative fashion or in parallel play, to reduce the transaction cost of creating this low carbon economy. And this means that whether it's about technology standards, institutional integrity and dynamics, as well as market standards, uh, it is important that whether or not things are done hand in hand or separately, they have to be developed in such concert that it would do so in such a way that reduce the transaction cost of the Zorkanic economy. It is therefore extremely important to build on what all the other panelists have been saying. In the, I mean, I think Antoine gave a long, wonderful list of technology, for example, and there were discussions around green finance and green piloting as well earlier on. All of these are good ideas that we need to build on to make sure that we focus on reducing the transaction costs so that we are not creating unnecessary ones. At the same time, one issue that I spend a bit of time thinking about, about is about trade, which is historically quite controversial. It is controversial in the UK-China context as well as EU-China context in terms of, in fact, nowadays, all contexts by the sound of it in terms of trade. But at the same time, as we move into the development of the global low-carbon economy, it means that we are going into more and more thinking and practice around what does green industrialization mean, and therefore the concept of green industrial policy. What is becoming quite clear at the moment is that it, there needs to be a lot more joint thinking and joint development about what that really means. And certainly in the context of WTO and others, that there are still you know, there's still quite a lot of work that needs to be done around what really are green subsidies and the day that has stopped for a couple of decades. It's now time to sort of bring that back in terms of what is, how green is green subsidies? How do you make green subsidies green as a way of standard setting that actually would be part of obviously the reduction of the transaction costs, as I said, about the low carbon economy. Related to that are questions around CBAMs and carbon tariffs that other people have also mentioned a little bit, which again, without going into much detail about it, what is quite clear is that we, it, we will see some form of it now. And the danger is not whether or not someone is going to do it. The danger is whether or not people are going to do it separately. So that we are, we are, we are left with lots of different types of carbon tariff regimes with different, different ways of measurement, different ways of different ways of, of, of baselines, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that would enormously increase costs for businesses as well as costs for countries and also the cost of global decarbonization in general, which is why it is extremely important that we focus around the reduction, as I said, of transaction costs in the delivery of the low carbon economy as all the, all the, all the countries we are talking about, China, EU, UK, others, are already going to be the joint custodians of this global low carbon economy, as we have to build it while we're learning how to do it at the same time. Which means that if we can focus on delivering those specific leverage, which will help reduce the transaction costs, such as the fact that 
you know, what, what are green subsidies? Let's, let's look at them. What, what, should, what, what are the acceptable green tariffs and green subsidies, et cetera, uh, and other technology and other standards so that we're not really overlapping and developing them in parallel in such a way that ultimately deter the, import, uh, the, deter the progress rather than smooth the progress. So last but certainly not least, I feel that in the context of UK, definitely, it is important to mention that obviously as the coast of COP26 and in the context of the multilateral collaboration, there were a lot more probably collaborative opportunities with China and other countries. At the same time, as we move into COP27, it is more important than ever, some of the unfinished business around COP26, which were around finance, which were around obviously the integrity piece. I saw the UN announcement of the net zero panel yesterday, and therefore would have implications for green finance, et cetera. And all these are traditional areas that UK, China, EU are working a lot together. And therefore all of these, again, I think with the spirit that we need to reduce the transaction costs and also create, again, I'm gonna emphasize that again, I don't, I don't feel that we need to make everybody say that they love each other and play together, but whether you play together or not, it is important that we are parallel playing in such a way that actually lead to the co-creation of standards and framework, that whether it's about just transition investment framework, whether it's about phasing out overseas co-finance, whether it's about new technology standards. We do it in such a way that does not increase the transaction cost because otherwise we will be running ahead of ourselves in a way that is not welcome and therefore we'll be in fact reducing the speed that we know we need in order to move forward as fast as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernice, for your very nice comments. I would like to thank our four panelists for your wonderful comment in the first round. It's really very difficult to have gathered all our uh, wonderful experts together. We are already a bit behind the schedule, but I'm still going to dive into the second round of questions. And uh, please, each of our experts answer the question within two minutes. The first question will be for Dr. Chao to further strengthen the e Europe-China collaboration on energy and climate ch change. What are the major challenges from the perspective of China and how we can overcome these challenges? Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to be very uh, simply answering these, yeah. this question. I think most points have been covered quite comprehensively. The most important thing I believe would be trust. My keyword is trust. We will have to uh, base our understanding of each other on trust and uh, need to learn about each other's concerns. Uh, for example, for the EU to learn about the, ter the determination of China towards low carbon development and the potential efforts that China is going to make in this process. And also China in the process of economic uh, transition is facing uh, quite huge challenges and with such an understanding and trust politicians think tanks scholars and companies etc cetera, etc cetera, could engage in more in-depth communication and uh, uh, genuine communication so that we can understand each other better and uh, build a bilateral relationship that features win-win cooperation and create a new landscape of geopolitical development uh, that uh, considers uh, climate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chao. Uh, between people and also between countries, uh, mutual trust is of great importance. What are the major barriers that prevent further strengthening uh, EU-China uh, collaboration, what could be done to overcome the above barriers? Please. Uh, please unmute yourself. Is it me, Kevin? Uh, yes. Ah, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, yes. Well, uh, well. First, first, I think it's uh, you know the summit that we have today is uh, is of course extremely important uh, because uh, uh, we need to talk and keep talking. Uh, the second point is uh, clearly that we need to see beyond. We need to see more ambition in terms of uh, decarbonization objectives, and we need to see some real 
progress, some real factual progress that one can track to really see that, you know, these are not just empty words, but that there is a reality behind these. So I think that that will really matter a lot. And then I think uh, what we would need to see also is some uh, successful collaboration among the private sector to decarbonize as opposed to strategic rivalries and uh, you know technological theft and uh, and uh, you know uh, fights about subsidies so so we we should really try to to think of areas and and good examples to show that well you know there is a good business cases there is a good opportunities in, in some areas to work together so i think this will also enhance trust and show also both governments that uh, you know, um, this is not just about economic warfare, but uh, that beyond there is uh, some real uh, uh, potential for collaboration. And uh, and Kevin, you you mentioned indeed the critical metals. That's I think a very interesting uh, area because to be fair, it's true that in Europe we see China's uh, leading position uh, sometimes as a threat or as a risk. But the point is. I think if we are to think longer term, that there is a mutual interest, both uh, from the Chinese side as from our side, to, for example, uh, develop more sustainable mining activities, more transparent mining activities, not least because this is what the energy transition requires, and this is what clients require, right? So if you want to buy, if you want to sell Chinese electric vehicles in Europe, uh, you will have to show that uh, you know the metals are used uh, are sustainable, are, are responsible, uh, and that the entire value chain uh, is uh, as low carbon as possible. So, so in a way, there is a mutual interest here, and uh, and I'm sure that uh, this can also uh, bring some uh, some opportunities for for economic and industrial cooperation. So, so let's hope that uh, this can uh, this that things can move in the, in this direction. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Kantuan. So, um, and my next question is for Dr. Shao. You specialize in bulk commodity related research. According to your research, what are the implications of the ongoing global energy shock and rising energy security anxieties on Europe China collaboration on energy and climate change? Uh, thank you. I think there really deserves a further study uh, because energy price at the moment, no matter that of the traditional energy or new energies, uh, the the price the prices are rising together. This might be pushing the world to a very sensitive uh, position, and the transition cost is going to be higher than ever, even to an extent where the emerging economies cannot afford it. So the price of both traditional and the new energies need to be brought down, and the traditional energy capacity should be complemented by with other techn with other energies. For example, in China, coal is a key form of energy. So now, what we are advocating is the more efficient usage of coal, and. Uh, there can be high uh, efficiency of, of coal usage with better technologies. And with such technologies, uh, based on our current energy portfolio, optimization can be made possible. And if there is such technology in Europe, we can actually share with each other the market as well as the technology to promote the high efficient usage of traditional energy. Thank you very much. For you, uh, given where we are in terms of UK-China relations, I wonder whether you have any suggestion on how to improve the bilateral energy and climate ties between these two countries. Please. Thank you. I mean, as I said earlier, I think the the same dynamics that drive other geopolitical and economic relations obviously is affecting UK-China relations as well. At the same time, as the co-creator and the hopefully joint custodian of the global low carbon economy look into the future, it's important that they focus on areas where there are common common interests, and that would include, as I mentioned earlier, trade, investment, and finance, where there are clear opportunities for UK and China to continue the collaboration that had been underway. 
and many of which were under the aegis when the UK was a presidency, which was obviously at the time where it gave a sort of different tinge around the collaboration because it was anchored in the UNFCCC among other multilateralism. But at the same time, there's no reason for some of this not to continue, particularly as the UK also would have an interest looking forward as it hasn't really done enough around green steel that others have talked about and others, for example, technology development, that there are opportunities for China and the UK in principle to, to do more talking and do more stuff around which there are common interests, such as, for example, green steel, as well as most definitely, so the green hydrocarbons, where it's an area which we touched on a little bit with different groups, but probably not enough in terms of negative emissions technology. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful comments. It's really a pity that our side event has only one hour. So because we only have about one hour for each side event, but we couldn't take more questions because our time is very limited. But definitely, we hope there will be more opportunities to talk to each other. So now we would like to come to the closing part. So first of all, I will give floor back to the Director General of the National Center for Climate Change Strategy and International Cooperation, Xu Huaqing, to make a closing remark. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Kevin. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be invited for our today's side event. I have noticed that we today we focus on the energy transition between China and Europe, and also in the climate change energy transition, what are the opportunities we have available in the market? After listening to the presentations by all the speakers and the comments, especially in the Q&A session, I think I'm quite inspired. I think based on the previous discussion here we have today, especially China has already released about this concept and proposal documents on the carbon peaking and the carbon neutrality, as well as the action plan recently released by the Chinese government. I think that for the green transition of China and China-Europe collaboration on the transition, I want to make four points to share with you. The first point I would like to make is that I want to emphasize China has already proposed that the economic and the social development, as well as the green transition, will play the leading role. There are three key words here. The first one is the planning work of the green transition. The second one is to optimize the regional layout. So that means in certain provinces and the regions, we will focus on how to issue some policies to support the local economy in green transition. The third one is to encourage the lifestyle consumption of the green transition. This is also very crucial for the carbon neutrality. Second point, China has also made it very clear that the green transition of the energy will be one of the priorities. So I will not go into the details, but you can see that the first one is on the coal replacement and the transition. The second one is on the new energy. The third sector is the hydropower. The fourth one is the nuclear power in a steady and secure way. Number five is the consumption of a balance between oil and natural gas. Number six is on the new power plant. The previous speakers mentioned that the coal-based power plant, the coal consumption, and diversify the local economy to reduce their reliance on the coal. The third point I want to make is that China has also made it very clear that during the green transition, we need to keep in mind of the possible risks. So, for example, 
the geopolitical, the Russian-Ukraine conflict, or the energy security challenges faced by Europe now. These are very inspiring. So in China, we need to consider the total reserve of the energy. Energy security and energy supply, as well as the economic development, shall be the bottom line to guarantee. We also need to have a science-based promotion of the energy replacement to gradually replace the new the traditional energy with a new energy to have a steady and a smooth transition of the energy so as to ensure the energy security all the time. Number four, China has also made it very clear that in the technology financing and financial collaboration of the green transition, there can be more opportunities for collaboration. For example, in China and Europe, we can work more on, we can collaborate more on the trading of the green and low carbon products and working on the standardization or taxonomy of the green products, as well as the green finance and financing support, as well as the green belt and the road initiative. So I think that through this kind of collaboration I mentioned between China and Europe, we can build the green partnership between China and Europe. So these are the four points I would like to make in my closing remark. And also, I would like to thank the organizer and all the speakers today. And you have made a wonderful speech. Thank you much. So thank you very much, Mr. Xu, for your wonderful summary. And also, you have pointed out some future policy collaboration. Project direct on energy transition at GI Lab China to deliver a brief, uh, a brief closing remarks. Anders, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And yes, my name is Anders Hovey. I'm the project director for the Sino German Energy Transition Project, which is implemented by GIZ uh, together with Agora and Dina on behalf of the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action in partnership with the China National Energy Administration. And I would just want to say uh, my own thank you uh, for what I consider uh, to be a great success in uh, organizing and attending this event today. We've heard insights from China and from across Europe about a number of different areas of collaboration and cooperation. I think the phrase that I really picked up on was this idea of the co-creation of a low carbon economy, which is that we are all clearly going to be involved and indeed the whole society in Europe and Asia are all involved in this creation of a low carbon economy. So thank you, uh, Ms. Lee, for bringing the, this good phrasing. Um, I, I don't want to make uh, lengthy remarks because we're over time, but I would just highlight that we heard areas of cooperation that cover institutions, markets, technology, policy, and we also heard about specific areas, uh, sectors that we should pay attention to. I just would highlight a few, which are nuclear energy, uh, green hydrogen, distributed renewable energy, critical materials supplies, and even macroeconomic factors that are affecting the energy transition, um, including in local areas. I want to agree with Mr. Xu, who was very eloquent about the specific areas of cooperation that we could focus on in the future, which included, uh, he mentioned, uh, green standards, as well as trading of green products. I would highlight that, as well as the possibility for high, uh, trading um, green credits for uh, low carbon energy, uh, making sure that this area, which is emerging in China, is uh, compatible with international systems so that um, China and Europe can both benefit from trading green energy in the future. I would just uh, wrap up uh, now by thanking, of course, uh, our overall host, Agora, and uh, Kevin Tu, Jesse Scott, of course, in particular. I'd also like to thank the panelists, Dr. Yu, uh, Dr. Chao, um, Mr. El Mezeka, and Ms. Li. And finally, I'd also like to thank Mr. Xu for his closing remarks. And thank you all for joining. I hope that all of you in the audience will, will keep in touch with Agora, with GIZ, uh, with SIIS, and uh, look forward to the excellent contents uh, that we will uh, each be producing separately and some of the contents which we'll be producing on all of these areas of collaboration together in the future. So thank you again for a very successful event. And that's it for me. Back to you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Anders, for your very concise and insightful, nice remarks. Before the concluding of today's dialogue, 
I would like to hand over the mic to my colleague Mariana Moras Gribina for some last minutes advertisement. Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kevin. And many thanks to all the panelists, to my colleagues at Agora, to BTD for organizing this very short but still very rich in content webinar. If there's any comments or questions regarding the contact, uh, content of the webinar, uh, you can always contact the panelists or my colleagues directly, or just send an email to webinar at agora-energiewende.de. Uh, my colleague Maxi has already put this uh, in our chat box. And if you would like to keep up to date to, uh, about our upcoming events, please register uh, for our newsletter or you can also check uh, our events on our website in the events section. Also, you can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. And um, now, according to uh, Agora's webinar tradition, I would like to ask everyone, all the participants, um, to turn on their cameras so we can see your faces before we say, uh, Yes, perfect. Everyone, everyone, uh, just turn on your cameras. Let me, uh, let us, uh, let's everyone see your faces before we wave each other goodbye. Um, thank you so much. I wish everyone a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. See you next time.